Okay. Okay, guys. Today we have Yorgos. Uh, he's going to talk about these origin limits, origin limits on n equals four superior Bill's amplitudes at finite coupling. Uh, we thank you, Yorgos, for accepting our in our invitation. And uh, please take it away. Thank you very much, Joao. And uh, yes, as I was saying, it's great to be back uh, to Porto, if only even virtually. Uh, and uh, I should start by saying that today is International Women's Day. This is why I have this little banner over here. Uh, and uh, we have gone uh, a long ways, but uh, we st still shouldn't forget that uh, there's much more effort to be made on all of our parts to reach gender equality and equality in general. And I just wanted uh, for us to remember and reflect a little bit on this and now in the beginning. All right, and with this, uh, I will close my camera and uh, mention that, yes, today I'll be talking about some recent work with uh, Benjamin Basel, Lance Dixon, and Andy Liu uh, that uh, will appear in PRL soon and it based, is based also on earlier work with uh, Benjamin and Lance and also relates to work that I had been doing with my student, Nicolas Hengia Desi. Uh, so this talk will be about scattering amplitudes, uh, which are, uh, of course, ubiquitous objects uh, in quantum field theory. They are uh, uh, the, um, uh, the bridge between theory and experiment. Uh, they are, uh, 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 yes, um, uh, the, the matrix elements of the S matrix, the, their absolute squares are related to cross sections, which is what we measure in experiments. Uh, and so being able to compute them uh, is uh, uh, efficiently uh, and to higher orders is uh, necessary in practice if you want to make uh, contact with uh, the collider experiments at CERN. Uh, and uh, yes, for example, the, uh, the upgrade of the LHC to high luminosity in the next 10 to 15 years, uh, precision will be one of the main uh, yes, frontiers uh, to discover, uh, but of course, uh, also understanding their structure, or understanding quantum field theory, I should say, beyond the perturbative regime is also mathematically very important. Uh, so not just being going in the perturbative regime to higher orders, but being able to say things uh, beyond uh, even non-perturbatively. And as is perhaps illustrated by the Clay Mathematics Foundation Lenin Prize, having to do with the uh, non perturbative aspects of quantum field theory. Uh, so, my strategy in this talk will be to focus on the simplest interacting uh, gauge theory, which is, of course, uh, in the heart of many of us in this uh, uh, circle, and equals for super young males. And in particular, I will be talking about the theory in the uh, um, uh, large color limit where only the toothed coupling is the parameter that it remains. This is what scales fixed as I take the number of colors to infinity. Uh, and we know for many years that uh, the theory is integrable in this uh, uh, large color limit, and one can compute exact physical quantities uh, in this coupling, in the toothed coupling. Uh, and perhaps again in this audience, I can flash a celebrated example that all of us are proud of and perhaps can marvel, marvel uh, um, uh, its beauty. Uh, this is the Casp anomalous dimension, uh, which appears in many different places, including uh, it controls the spectrum of operators with very large spin. Uh, and this quantity, as you can see over here, uh, is uh, related to uh, an, uh, a geometric series uh, of uh, a, a matrix, a semi-infinite matrix uh, uh, that we multiply, yes, in different powers, and then we take the first component. And then the elements of this matrix are uh, precise functions of the coupling, as you see here. They depend uh, exactly on G, so we can compute this quantity uh, 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 um, uh, yes, without uh, making any kind of approximation. Uh, and so given the great success in, uh, for example, uh, computing gamma cusp and other anomalous dimensions, 
It's a natural question whether we can make similar progress for amplitudes or other quantities, correlators and so on. And your group is, of course, very, very uh, um, active also in exploring other quantities and solving, in a sense, this theory. Uh, but let me talk to you about uh, uh, the, uh, the status in solving n equals 4, at least as far as the amplitude is concerned. So uh, for uh, multiplicity 4 and 5, we already know them to all loops. Uh, and they are given by the so-called BDS ansatz. And then for n equals uh, six or greater, this is our canvas, this is our playground. This is uh, the coupling, the toothed coupling that I had mentioned before. So if you're close to here, uh, you are uh, in the weak uh, uh, coupling regime in perturbation theory. And this is schematically a parameter that, uh, uh, um, yes, uh, encodes the kinematics. If you are close to, uh, zero in this uh, uh, axis. This means that you are in special kinematics. If you're far away, it means that you are considering the absolute most general kinematic configurations that your amplitude uh, uh, depend on. Uh, and so in this axis, in the perturbative regime, we have the amplitude bootstrap. It's a method that exploits the analytic structure uh, of amplitudes to compute them at general kinematics, but uh, at weak coupling uh, in the weak coupling expansion, albeit to very high loop orders. Uh, and then, in particular limits like the, the collinear or the multi regi limit, uh, we also have uh, the emergence of integrability. This has been known for some time now. So it's not yet understood in general kinematics, but in spe some special corners. And this allows us, in fact, uh, in these special kinematics to compute amplitudes exactly. And finally, so the equivalence of the theory to strings uh, in type 2b strings, uh, we also have a description of amplitudes uh, at the leading strong coupling uh, result in uh, uh, order in terms of a TBA or a, or a Y system. Uh, so this is, uh, uh, yes, uh, where we currently stand. And today, I want to talk to you about a particular new limit. I want to put a new limit on the map that, if you wish, pushes the boundaries uh, of the, the territory we have charted so far. Uh, and I will describe what it is, but it is essentially amounts to uh, setting some natural kinematic variables to zero. And that's why the name origin. Uh, uh, because it's, in a sense, the, the origin of the coordinates of these coordinates, the, the, the origin in the frame of these coordinates. Uh, and uh, um, uh, if you wish, my motivation, one of my prime motivations is, of course, with uh, all this progress of exploring more and more uh, uh, territory, to be able to indeed compute the all loop or finite uh, as matrix of the theory, both it, you know, at uh, uh, finite coupling and in general kinematics. Any questions in, about this very broad, uh, yes, uh, uh, picture so far? No, I think it's fine. Okay, so this is the outline. Uh, I will remind you a few things about n equals four amplitudes. Then I will uh, also briefly review uh, uh, our previous story, uh, the, uh, what we know about the six particle uh, origin, the simplest non-trivial amplitude. And then I will move on to describe what happens <coughs> at higher multiplicity. And this is split in, in further three parts. I will tell you how to classify all these possible limits. These are, uh, as, as you increase the multiplicity, there are many, many different uh, uh, inequivalent such limits that the cluster algebras can allow us to, uh, to, to classify. Uh, then <clears throat> I will tell you how the amplitude depends on these limits based on known perturbative data and also by this amplitude bootstrap method. Uh, and finally, I will conclude with how to uh, uh, be able to conjecture the amplitudes at finite coupling and at all, at all n by looking at then the strong coupling description that I also showed you in this picture before concluding. All right, let's go. So I will be talking about the simplest amplitudes of the simplest theory. These are the so-called maximally helicity violating, where you have all but two <coughs> helicities, 
which are good quantum numbers, the, the projections of spin on the direction of motion for massless particles are good quantum numbers. So all but two are uh, the same. Uh, if you have one but two or all the same, or but all but one or, or not, uh, all uh, in the same, then the amplitude vanish. So this is the, that's what's the simplest non-trivial. Uh, and in n equals four, one uh, important <coughs> uh, uh, yes uh, uh, piece of the remarkable structure of the theory is that in the, in a sense we are computing two things. We are getting two in the price of one. Uh, uh, the amplitude of the theory are also dual to Wilson loops, uh, so uh, non-local objects, uh, path ordered exponentials of gauge fields, and so on. Uh, but we, which are evaluated along a light-like contour. Uh, and uh, uh, this is then how the kinematics is defined. Namely, uh, each line segment of this Wilson loop corresponds to an external particle momentum. And uh, since we are talking about massless particles, these are indeed light-like segments. And uh, the, uh, this duality between amplitudes and Wilson loops also uh, implies that uh, uh, after taking care of some well-known infrared divergences, then uh, the, this normalized amplitude, which has been traditionally uh, also, uh, one considers the logarithm, in fact, of the normalized amplitude, or the so-called remainder function, is now just a conformal invariant function of the momentum of the Mandelstam variables, or these, uh, um, I guess, uh, dual, dual coordinates. Uh, so this is the, the, the quantity I will consider in particular. The, uh, um, uh, yes, uh, the BDS normalized amplitude or the, the remainder function. And it will be a function, as I mentioned, of these cross ratios. Uh, uh, this is the so-called, yes, dual conformal invariance. Uh, so, with this, uh, maybe, uh, yes, uh, brief reminder of, uh, let's say, the quantities to consider and their kinematic dependence, uh, let's uh, talk about what the origin is. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yes. Okay. So, is the, uh, does the answer to that this uh, nice form also in a known, known uh, MHE? Uh, very good question. Uh, indeed, uh, so super amplitudes are equivalent to super Wilson loops. Uh, and uh, so there is an analogous uh, decomposition. Uh, the, what becomes slightly more, uh, 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 yes, uh, complicated is that uh, uh, more uh, like amplitudes of that different multiplicity don't depend on just a single scalar function. Uh, amplitudes of uh, other, sorry, not multiplicity, other helistic configuration. They also have some rational, non-trivial rational factors uh, uh, where kinematic uh, dependence hides. And uh, since there are different in equivalent uh, rational factors, each of them also comes with a different bosonic function, uh, multiplying it that they see the loop corrections. They, they, they rational functions, they correspond to three level, let's say, contributions. Uh, and then the, the, um, the, the bosonic coefficients are then loop corrections. Does this answer your question? Uh, yes, has this uh, been uh, worked out specifically? Uh, has, it has been worked out, is that what you asked? Uh, yes. Uh, so, uh, everything has been worked out uh, uh, in terms of uh, the decomposition of uh, the amplitude into yes rational pieces. Uh, so yes, this has been worked out. Uh, okay. Yeah, yeah. These rational pieces are generally leading singularities or Grassmannian integrals. So there is uh, like uh, uh, yes, this is something that has been worked out, and then. Okay, how much we know of the bosonic coefficients at higher loops? Uh, yes, this depends. So uh, yeah. currently for MHV and then MHV, uh, so just one more minus, uh, uh, so the current frontier at any multiplicity is two loops. 
uh, for uh, like uh, multiplicity seven, you can go up to four loops for both MHV and NMHV, which are the only Helicity choices that exist for six and seven particles, because you you can it, it doesn't matter if you change the sign of all the legs simultaneously. It's also a symmetry. Uh, so um, yes, so this is the the current status. Uh, do, would you like to ask anything further or? No, no, no. It's good. It's good. Thanks. Okay. Good. All right, so then let's go to origins, to the six particle origin in particular. So I mentioned to you about the amplitude bootstrap, uh, and indeed it uh, has been developed uh, by Lance and collaborators. Uh, and then I joined and extended it also to seven particle case, uh, among other things. Uh, but one can consider this limit where these natural uh, variables, the cross ratios, uh, go to zero. Uh, just look for patterns, you say, you, you, if you wish, in the known perturbative results, which have reached uh, uh, a, a seven loop result, which is one of the highest in any gauge theory. Uh, so by <clears throat> considering this limit, so it's a point in the space of kinematics, uh, we noted in this paper uh, that uh, the six uh, particle remainder function takes a very, very simple form. Uh, first of all, it is just a second, it's a double logarithm of uh, the kinematic variables of the problem. These are all vanishing, uh, so these are divergent, uh, but uh, in general, this divergence could go up to two times the loop order. Uh, so the fact that uh, 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 the, the remainder function is only quadratic up to these uh, divergent logarithms, or if you wish that the amplitude exponentiates, it uh, exhibits a sudak of like behavior. If the amplitude itself is exponentiated double logarithm. This is a very, very uh, uh, unusual and interesting feature. Uh, and furthermore, uh, so yes, this is what I just said. Uh, in fact, there are no rational terms. Uh, sorry, there are no linear terms. It's just quadratic and then constant, and then things that vanish as you take the cross ratios to zero. Uh, and furthermore, <clears throat> one of these, so the, kinema, the coupling dependence is in these coefficients. And uh, at least one of them behaved extremely simply. You see that uh, it was just uh, uh, like, uh, it was just powers of pi. Uh, with some rational coefficients. Uh, so nothing more complicated than just powers of pi. Uh, and uh, even more so by just staring at it, you can see that uh, it has, uh, one can ac actually express this in a one line finite coupling formula uh, for this anomalous dimension. This is what we noticed and we got excited uh, at the very beginning. Uh, and of course, this quantity was not the first place it had appeared. It had already appeared in the light like limit of the so called simplest four point correlator or the octagon. Uh, 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 yes, uh, the large charge four point correlator, uh, uh, analyzed, yes, by many people. Uh, and yes, the, the, the light li limit taken by the Litsi and Korczemski. Uh, and so this uh, definitely motivates us to uh, try to understand why, uh, or to, to see if uh, this is not just about one particular quantity, but uh, how about, okay, the gamma cusp we know already, I showed you before, but how about this anomalous dimension? How about this constant term? Uh, and this, <clears throat> I will not uh, uh, describe how we go to the final answer, but I will uh, spell out what the final answer is because we play a role also in higher point origin. Uh, so uh, by looking at the better understood collinear limit and resumming the known expansion around it, uh, this is the OPE, Wilson loop OPE or collinear or pentagon OPE, uh, we arrive at the following expression where now it's the same, uh, uh, in fact, formulas before, but they have changed the, uh, 
the subscripts of these anomalous dimensions. Uh, and they are given by a very, very simple deformation of the Bizer Tibbetts Staudacher kernel or the cusp anomalous dimension I showed you before, uh, where uh, now we have introduced this additional angle, tilt angle, alpha uh, inside uh, this uh, uh, finite coupling uh, matrix, this uh, semi infinite matrix. This is the so called tilted uh, BES kernel. Uh, and so we, we have a parameter in the game, and really we can tune it. The cusp anomalous dimension corresponds to pi over four. The simplest uh, octagon anomalous dimension corresponds to alpha equals zero. And the additional uh, uh, angle that showed up in the six particle amplitude was pi over three. Uh, so I just, yes, remind you what this uh, uh, like matrix elements are. Uh, and we could even do better. We could even uh, find uh, the constant term in this case in terms of some uh, log depth. Uh, of this uh, uh, infinite matrix. So that was the status, uh, let's say, yes, about two years ago, uh, two and a half years ago. Um, are, are there any questions uh, up to this point about the six particle origin? So this is only for uh, MHP, right? Yes. Indeed, right. yes. Uh, so the NMHV is, for example, six particle amplitude uh, does not uh, have this simple exponentiated double order behavior. It uh, it does uh, uh, include higher powers. We have still looked at data, let's say perturbative data, but uh, there isn't much structure in there. There. Uh, one can, one can predict some coefficients, uh, uh, let's say of the leading logarithms with, which increase with the loop order. And uh, this uh, Lance did it independently. I also did it uh, with my then yes, student, uh, Seva Chesnov. But uh, yeah, no, no finite coupling uh, result of this, uh, of, yes, of this completeness. And, uh, how did you obtain uh, R6 was just uh looking at the perturbative data and guessing or was what it using a pentagon pentagon decomposition uh, so that's a, that's a great question so we were definitely uh, yes motivated by the uh, so first of all the this uh, uh, like exponentiated double logarithm this was exp uh, 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 form form was uh, uh, observed by weak coupling data uh, and then we thought about the OPE and uh, um, uh, resumming the OPE uh, is indeed something that is a relatively well posed problem. One can uh, start from this infinite expansion around the collinear limit uh, and then try to resum some of the uh, yes, terms uh, to more general limits. Uh, and these general limits have some uh, overlap with the origin limit. And this is what we did. Uh, and uh, uh, then at some point, uh, we, we had to make some leaps of faith as well. Uh, so we could not prove, uh, let's say, all steps. But uh, uh, through this pro process, we could, uh, for example, very easily produce new perturbative data and also massage let's say the integrand uh, uh, of the yes, OPE resummation uh, such that we could, yes, find the patterns that led us to this form over here. It's not a derivation, but uh, because some steps, we, we could not prove the equivalent, say, of the integrand along some steps that we are doing at finite coupling, we could prove it at weak coupling. Uh, but uh, uh, yes, uh, this was definitely uh, how we, we arrived at this. Okay, thanks. All right, and uh, just to <clears throat> give a flavor uh, that we can really do things at finite coupling, this is a plot. <laughs> 
where we have <clears throat> the cusp anomalous dimension here, and then the hexagon uh, and the octagon one. You see, in fact, uh, that uh, uh, the, the value decreases as you increase alpha. Uh, the dots are the, uh, the numerical expressions of the exact finite coupling formula, whereas the lines here and here are weak and strong coupling expansions that uh, agree very well. Uh, and I should say that uh, this, uh, yes, uh, uh, origin story uh, was not confined, let's say, to amplitudes, uh, but uh, also had uh, broader uh, uh, applications and implications. And uh, Vasco, for example, together with uh, Carlos, who is here, Bertini and uh, Pedro Vieira, uh, they uh, used these results in order to obtain three-point structure constants of large spin operators uh, in, by looking at the six-point correlator in the snowflake channel, where indeed uh, uh, the external kinematics become, uh, yes, light-like uh, and so on. There are some additional degrees of freedom that are taking large. But uh, this, uh, the, the, then the duality between correlators and Wilson loops was useful in this respect. Uh, and also, particularly, the alpha equals zero value of the BES kernel has appeared in many other places, uh, including amplitude the Coulomb branch of the theory, uh, where the, the scalars have a VEV uh, and the uh, vacuum expectation value, and also in form factors of the theory, either off shell, uh, but two particle, or even for building blocks of higher point on shell form factors. So it seems that uh, this object that we defined, uh, uh, it's true that we defined it, uh, if you wish, uh, we, we had three, indeed, we had three different quantities that very much look like the Kasman Lomalus dimension. And then we thought, can we fudge it? Can we inc include the variable so that we have a uniform description? That's how we, we, we did it this way. But uh, it seems that uh, this quantity in this deformation could play a role, uh, a more general role, at least for n equals for integrability. Uh, so uh, this work also opened very many questions that uh, we're seeking answers and that we started uh, thinking about. What is the physical significance of alpha? Can one really um, assign it to some string, uh, yes, uh, uh, some geometric configuration and so on. Uh, does it have a meaning of, of its own? Uh, are there other physical quantities that gamma alpha describes for other values of alpha, uh, apart from the ones we have seen so far? Uh, and so this recent work, just to give you the punchline of this recent work, so that if you are interested, you can stay. If not, you can decouple. Uh, so uh, the, the upshot is that <clears throat> uh, we do find that uh, the n particle remainder function uh, has precisely the same form uh, at higher points. We find limits, I should say, where the, uh, the remainder function, the n particle amplitude, has this precise form, uh, where uh, um, this is just a simple, uh, yes, rescaling or, yes, redefinition, uh, 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 like minor subtraction to get things on an even footing of the, uh, like, tilted anomalous dimension. And these are all the possible values that alpha can take uh, for n particle amplitude. So if you wish, at least we answered part, we started answering this part of the question. These are the possible values that alpha can take uh, for uh, n particle amplitudes. Uh, and uh, it's 3n minus 15 of them, uh, as many, in fact, as there are uh, kinematic variables in the problem. Uh, and uh, uh, this is the like very broad strokes, uh, let's say, content of the paper, uh, but it really. Uh, um, uh, and yes, and these are again polynomials in uh, the kinematic variables that vanish in the liberal, again, quadratic polynomials. Uh, so same similar form. However, there are, there are many, many, uh, 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 yes, let's say more detailed questions or more precise questions that one could, should answer. Uh, like if one uh, uh, 
start thinking about it a little bit more. The first one is, what are the generalizations of these abilities? And as I mentioned, it turns out that there's many, very many of them. Uh, it's not uh, at all straightforward. And one has to think about it a little bit. And this is where cluster algebras come into, into the game. Then once you think of limits that are natural generalizations of the six particle one, you look at the amplitude dependence there. And uh, this is where uh, finding what this polynomial of the kinematic variables is, is and checking that it is quadratic. Uh, this is where perturbative data help. And finally, it's the values, let's say, of alpha uh, uh, that uh, then the strong coupling dis description was instrumental uh, in revealing. Uh, uh, in fact, it could do more. It could obtain at least some of these also polynomials, but uh, hopefully we'll get there. OK, so now. I'm going to move on to the details of the last paper, unless there are any questions. Uh, I have a question. So what um, what are these cluster algorithms? I will define them, uh, yes, very soon. I think it's the next thing coming up, more or less. OK, OK, thank you. More questions? All right, let's go. And I should say this 43 is not the total number of slides. So do not feel worried. Uh, I have extra bonus slides. Um, I will be done by, I think, 25 slides and we don't necessarily have to go all the way. So I think we're relatively good uh, as far as the, the schedule goes. So let's uh, think about uh, then origin limits. As I mentioned before, the six particle origin is uh, where all the cross ratios vanish. And you can think of it as uh, roughly uh, uh, a triple collinear limit. So if this is the six particle amplitude, then, uh, or the hexagon Wilson loop, because we have said they are equivalent. This is roughly flattening this hexagon into a triangle, roughly. This is uh, uh, what one can uh, roughly understand this limit for. Uh, the, the issue that prohibits uh, a simple <clears throat> answer to what the higher point origin limits is, is that in fact, we have uh, this number of dual conformal cross ratios. This number is just uh, the way of picking four points out of six. Uh, out of n, sorry, excluding uh, nearest neighbors. Uh, otherwise, it would be n minus 3 over 2. Uh, but so we have these many cross ratios, but nevertheless, we have much fewer uh, independent variables. And the fact that these two coincide for n equals 6 is an accident. So we cannot just uh, um, set all the cross ratios to zero, it, it's not possible. You can at most send uh, 3n minus 5 of them to zero. Uh, uh, not sorry, at most. You, 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 you hope, yes, you hope that you can get, you know, you, you, you can set for sure 3n minus 5 of them to zero because you can take a subset of them to be the independent variables and set them to zero. But this cannot guarantee by any means that the rest will also go to zero. And in fact, they don't. In most cases, they don't. Uh, for this, we uh, take inspiration from uh, the work of Nima, where he has defined uh, uh, the notion of positive kinematics, a region uh, in, let's say, the momenta of the particles, uh, where uh, 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 the amplitudes are busy, believed to be singularity free. They are completely real and, in fact, uh, even uh, in a sense positive, but at least their integrand is positive. Uh, so, uh, therefore, uh, if you want to look at simple divergent behavior, like this kind of like double logarithms, this is certainly divergent behavior, the first place to look at is at the boundary, at the boundary of this region. You have this region, it's well-defined. Why don't you look at the boundary and see if 
uh, you find them in origin limits. Uh, and uh, the cool thing about this region and its boundaries is that it's captured by these objects which are called cluster algebra. And this is what I will now define unless I went too fast on this. But uh, <laughs> this, is, this is the route with which we, we go into cluster algebra. These were defined by Fomin and Zelevinsky at the beginning of the millennium. And uh, they consist, their main ingredients, maybe I'm going to pass to you, uh, are a set of variables. These are the clusters, sometimes called X coordinates. Uh, and these uh, variables are grouped into overlapping sets. Uh, all sets have the same size. This is called the rank D. And it is said that it's called the cluster. There's therefore uh, the name cluster algebra. Overlapping means that X1 can appear in more than one cluster. It can appear in several of them or any other cluster variables. And uh, the very cool thing about them is that they, they are like a game of chess. They are like constructively generated. You start from an initial cluster uh, and then you have this uh, uh, like chess rule you move this pawn to the left, you move, uh, I don't know, the, the, the uh, horse uh, like uh, two front and one to the right and so on. So th there are certain rules that tells you how to transform these variables to get new variables in different clusters. So the, the, this, this, this uh, rule, this chess rule is encoded in a matrix B that has these elements B, I, J. Uh, its precise form isn't in, uh, that important. Uh, the important thing is that if you mutate, uh, 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 if you do the mutation associated to variable XK, let's say one of them, one from one to D is the Kth one, then you just invert this one in particular, the Kth variable, and you change, you multiply the rest, you do a rational transformation also on the, the rest. And this gives you all the new variables in the new cluster. And also uh, one can uh, uh, transform this matrix in a particular way, which is not impor that important. Uh, but uh, uh, apart from this uh, like, ma like main uh, essential ingredients of cluster algebras, um, uh, one can visualize them also by an exchange graph where each cluster is a vertex. And if two clusters are related by mutation, you also draw an edge among them. And I will show you like an exchange graph in the next slide, but let me, met, 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 let me maybe pause and ask you about, uh, uh, yes, any questions on the cluster algebra. I guess it's fine. <clears throat> okay, good. So let's look at uh, the, the six particle positive region, <clears throat> which is related to this A3 cluster algebra. Finite cluster algebras are labeled by dinking diagrams. So, so this is A3, this is uh, SU4, if you wish. It's the usual uh, dinking classification. So this is the exchange graph of the cluster algebra. Each dot over here is a cluster. And uh, uh, a cluster means that it's a collection of, uh, as I said, variables, these x1, x2, x3, uh, in this case. Uh, and uh, it is in this sense that uh, cluster algebras provide you essentially all parametrizations of the positive. So the positive region corresponds to all these x's being positive, and this is the interior, and less than infinity. So this is the interior of this polytope. So this is, uh, uh, this is a cluster, a collection of variables, uh, which is essentially a coordinate frame at the boundary of the positive region. Uh, and uh, edges correspond also to mutations. So if, uh, if I, uh, I start from this cluster and I mutate, I obtain the coordinates of a different cluster over here. Or I should say, if I mutate X2 with the, the um, rule I have over here, 
then I arrive at a new cluster and I therefore obtain a new parametrization of the positive region and of all its boundaries. So if you wish, cluster algebras provide you all possible parametrizations of this region of positive kinematics constructively. You start from one and you obtain all the rest for free. Uh, and uh, uh, in this example, yes, uh, one can, okay, I have worked out an example, an explicit example. Okay, I, 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 you have to take my word for it that the, the cross ratios I told you earlier are some rational functions of these like variables of the initial cluster. Uh, but that given, uh, from what I told you on the previous slide, you can yourselves uh, go from this coordinate frame of the positive region to this coordinate frame. Uh, for example, since I'm mutating along x2, it means that the new x2 variable x2 prime is just one over x2. I will, won't, won't go into the details of the rest, but uh, this is how you arrive at this cluster. And um, <laughs> Since these are coordinate frames, uh, of course, if I set all the axes of the uh, of a given cluster to zero, I really narrow down to one point at the boundary of the positive region. So this is uh, the what the vertex also amounts to. And then if I set all but one uh, to zero, then this gives you an edge at the boundary uh, of, the, of the positive region, and so on and so forth. Uh, George, uh, a simple question. Yes. So this positive region is just defined by uh, chi i, uh, it's greater than zero, right? Or does it have other, other meaning? How the positive region is defined, is that the question? Yeah, yeah. what's the definition of positive region? Okay, very good question. The positive region uh, is most transparently defined in terms of momentum twisters. So uh, uh, if you are in four dimensional, uh, uh, yes, dual conformal invariant kinematics, like in this theory, uh, you can describe it in the most uh, simple fashion by these momentum twister variables. Uh, and uh, these you can think of as uh, so instead of having a like four dimensional momentum describing uh, each part external particle you have a, a four <clears throat> dimensional uh, object a four component object this is the twister that is however scale invariant this is if you wish related to this dual conformal symmetry uh, and uh, if you have a collection of n of them like for an n particle process the positive region is that uh, uh, any, any minor of this matrix, four by n matrix, uh, for consecutive legs, uh, so for ordered legs, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, five, one, two, three, six, uh, is positive. Uh -huh. so maybe this was a bit uh, confusing and maybe I should uh, write this down, but. Uh, 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 yes, th there is a very precise notion uh, that, okay, is uh, to the moment tied to dual conformal invariant kinematics. Uh, I think it's fine. Thanks. All right. More questions? Is it trivial to see that this uh, positive region actually is the, the interior of the exchange graph? Uh, I couldn't follow that. Uh, I guess I, I understood how to build this graph, but not where the positivity region the interior comes from. Uh, let's see. Yes, uh, I have not given you a lot of information now. Uh, I mm -hmm. have tried to strip it down uh, to the like absolute uh, basics, but uh, the, um, the story is that uh, all these X coordinates, so these X size, mm -hmm. 
these xi's can be written as these four by four minors, i, j, j, l. Yes, i prime, j prime, j prime, j prime, and so on, uh, i prime, I don't know, j, j, l. Um, what should I have now? Uh, I J prime J prime uh, yes L prime yes so uh, and it is these objects that are um, these these minors so the positivity of these objects also uh, ensures the positivity of this object mm -hmm. so it has to do with really relating these x coordinates these uh, cluster variables to uh, invariant products of momentum twisters or these minors, these, these uh, four by four main minors of the so for n part of the kinematics you have z1 to zn that has one, two, three, four components. This is the momentum twister, and then uh, uh, I sorry. I J K L equals the determinant of uh, you know column Z I Z J Z K Z L and then uh, positivity positive region region is uh, I J K L is positive for i less than j, less than k, less than l, modulo cyclic symmetry. Mm -hmm. So one starts with, uh, yes, the, the, the kinematics in terms of momentum tw twisters, one defines the positive region as I have uh, uh, mentioned here in terms of the minors of this four by n matrix. Uh, one, uh, also defines these x coordinates to be products of these objects, and therefore one can prove that these are positive. Okay. <clears throat> Thanks. You're welcome. More questions? Uh, so, so these momentum with the variables, how are they related to the? Well, I guess it's okay. The, are, are they always related to the? Um, so the X like that, or like the... Are they related to what, sorry? So the... Okay, let, let me ask a different way. The, is there... Um, is the positive region also the region where the Xs are all positive? Always? The, these Xs, the X coordinates. Yes. Yes, indeed, it's the region where, as I said, the, the x's are positive and less than infinity. Uh, and uh, it's a quite remarkable theorem that these kind of transformations do not spoil positivity. <laughs> OK. If you start with a set of variables that are positive and you mutate them, all other variables that are can be constructed out of them, all these rational functions, of your original variables will also be positive. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. More questions? Uh, I do have a question. Uh, when you uh, were considering the 06 case and you gave the physical interpretation of having the hexagon becoming a, a triangle, you also have a visual interpretation in terms of this type of figures. Precisely, very good. So excellent. So the origin is indeed this point over here, yeah. or it could also be this point because uh, um, uh, completely specifying the kinematics uh, also means uh, specifying the sign of the spatial component. So there is parity symmetry of, of the momenta. There is parity symmetry that 
flips the, the spatial part of the component, that's a spatial reflection. And so Mandel's some invariants are blind to this, uh, but uh, nevertheless, uh, uh, it is a, you need to specify this also normal in the kinematics. So this, these two are parity related. Parity reflection is a reflection along the equatorial plane. Whereas, okay, the, the remainder function is parity invariant. So if you wish, you can uh, like keep half of this graph. Yes. And it's fine, no problem. Or you can identify points. You can also say it this way. You can identify points that are uh, antipodal. Okay, okay, thank you. And uh, also, let's say, let me add the for the experts, the the collinear limit or the OPE, the Pentagon OPE, are, is this line over here. Okay, uh, this is a like collinear limit. Uh, if you uh, resum the particular set of so-called gluonic excitations, gluon excitations of the Pentagon uh, OPE then you land into the double scaling limit. So the double scaling limit is this pentagon over here. Uh, so the, the, yes, the, the collinear limit is in a one dimension limit. You have one cross ratio vanishing and the other one becomes one minus the third one. So just one variable. The double, the double scaling limit, only one variable, one cross ratio vanishes, whereas the other are held fixed. And this is how also you can resum. You start from the collinear, you uh, 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 yes resum to the double scaling limit. You keep only the gluon uh, excitations, and once you have kept them, you are allowed to go to the origin limit, which normally does not overlap with the collinear. And just to complete the picture, since you seem to be interested, this is the soft or multi-regi limit of n equals four. Uh, so in this case, two cross ratios go to zero and go, one goes to one. And uh, yes, they are conformally equivalent. If you are in the Euclidean region, the amplitude vanishes in this soft limit. If you analytically continue, it's a non-trivial function and uh, there has been a lot of work on uh, trying to... Or in fact, it has been computed at finite coupling again from the graph built and again from a sort of, uh, uh, yes, resumming the OPE. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay, we spent some time on this, but it's good because uh, it means that you were, were interested and you were understanding, or at least we're trying to understand. Uh, so this is the definition then of higher point, point origins, uh, because we, we saw that, uh, origins, or oh, the hexagon origin was a point at the boundary of the positive region. Uh, and so it's very natural uh, to define origins as such, at least origin points. Define origin points as a, as a vertex at the boundary of the positive region. Note, I could have, I don't know, another point here on this line, but it doesn't seem relevant. Uh, we could pick points on these uh, like edges, but we will look at really vertices of this polytope. Uh, and we will ask that uh, a maximal number of cross ratios vanishes. Since we, we have all possible parameterizations of the positive region, we can do that. Uh, and here is the seven particle case, the cluster algebra or the, the exchange graph of, of the seven particle amplitude. It has 833 different clusters. Uh, and you see that uh, there is a 28 of them where uh, all but one of the cross ratios go to zero. So you cannot set all the cross ratio to zeros, <laughs> as I had promised, but you can set all but one. And the, the remaining one goes to one. Uh, and uh, these are the highlighted red uh, clusters in this picture. One would expect that this gives you only seven different limits, right? Because you just are the seven ways to pick uh, one of the cross ratios different from zero. Uh, however, uh, you can resolve, 
Cluster algebra itself resolves these limits. And this is in fact similar to this case where in the cross ratios, all this like uh, square over here is just a point. In cross ratio spaces corresponds to zero, zero, one. But it is resolved. Uh, the, the direction of approach to the limit or uh, rate of approach matters in cluster variables and cluster variables see it. Uh, so similarly, uh, some of the cross ratios go to zero faster, either the one before or after the one going to one. So they give you 14 and you also have their parity images they give you 28. So these are the total origin limits. Uh, and uh, we can also zoom in. So this was the entire exchange graph, all clusters. Now we can only keep these 28 clusters that I told you about. And very interestingly, we see that they are all connected. So of course, there are other clusters and so on that I removed. So when I remove the cluster uh, to zoom in, I also remove all connections uh, like to it. Uh, in other words, only keep connections on the on the clusters I have uh, edges along among the clusters I have kept. But it's interesting that all of them are connected uh, continuously into this uh, circle or cycle, uh, yes, yeah, cycle chain topology. Uh, and uh, this uh, was very intriguing to us because uh, can one guess? Well, if each of these vertices is, a, is a, an origin limit, how about the line connecting them? What happens there? And we looked at uh, the, so we had data, we had, uh, uh, as I mentioned, up to for loop data. This was work that I in, had initiated, uh, yes, uh, in the past and was completed from symbols. So from dropping constants, also including transcendental constants. Uh, and in fact, you see that uh, the amplitude is indeed, has indeed this quadratic logarithmic behavior. There are different now polynomials, quadratic polynomials in the cross ratios. Uh, uh, but uh, this behavior persists not only on these points, but also on the lines connecting them. So a new feature that starts appearing at, uh, at seven points is that uh, origin limits do not just correspond to points in the space of kinematics. They correspond to higher uh, like dimensional spaces, in this case, one dimensional spaces. So I will uh, uh, then, unless there are any questions, okay, I guess I am kind of running out of time. Uh, let me let me tell you then what the challenge is at, at higher points. We won't go like uh, uh, let's say one by one forever at infinitum, but uh, a, a challenge that shows up uh, at uh, n equals eight or higher uh, is that uh, the cluster algebra becomes infinite, uh, and so you cannot even find this exchange graph I drew to you. Uh, and then look for, uh, 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 yes, uh, the subset of origin limits. However, the fact that all the origin clusters are connected gives us hope for the seven part of the case, gives us hope that this might be true also at higher points. So we devised an algorithm where you just find one origin point cluster, you can, easily do this. In fact, you can uh, just once and for all find such a cluster for any n, and then you keep mutating and you check, is the new cluster obtained also an origin point? If yes, I continue mutating. If not, I stop. And uh, in this way, we found 1188 clusters of, uh, of origin limits. Uh, and uh, this was much simpler than trying to sift through, uh, okay, I should say, in fact, this, yes, this uh, like challenge 
a big piece of progress that was done a couple of years ago uh, simultaneously by me and my student and also groups at uh, Southampton and uh, at Southampton and Princeton uh, was to have a natural proposal how to render this cluster algebra finite. Uh, it's still huge. We are talking about a tremendous number and, uh, of clusters and trying to locate these inside of uh, this huge number would be a challenge. Uh, but uh, uh, doing the computation this way, checking that they were all contained also in this natural proposal, proposal further solidified our results. Uh, and this is a picture of uh, these uh, uh, origin limits. Uh, so uh, let me explain this a little bit. Uh, now, yes, there won't be many heavy formulas anymore. Uh, so uh, first of all, <clears throat> yes, uh, they are separated into nine classes these origins, depending on uh, <clears throat> which cross ratios go to zero or which go to one in the very strict limit. Uh, but these are further distinguished uh, with different uh, like uh, shapes if uh, there are different directions of approach to the same strict limit. So for example, Okay, maybe I should also go to the next picture. So, so if one forgets about the rate of approach, there are nine different uh, like uh, strict limits or classes of origin limits, uh, depending on which of the cross ratios become small and which approach one. Uh, and uh, uh, yes, the, these are the, the usual cross ratios we had up to now. Uh, where they are differed by three. These are like differed by four, also appear in the heptagon, it's octagon. And these are the numbers of different origin limits, which correspond to different rates of approach to this, uh, this strict limit. And uh, uh, you can, you have, um, you can think of these two, uh, uh, like, red nodes as being as being on the north pole so like i don't know an antenna on the north pole and then all the other origins covering a half sphere uh, and which ends in the equator on this black then origins uh, and i have dropped uh, the other half uh, the parity half so <laughs> Just so that we don't feel we are seeing double, I dropped the other half of the picture. So you should have, you should replicate this one more time for the other party half. Have a, let's say, a, a, yes, a, a reflection of all these, uh, these origin limits that uh, you, uh, you see over here. Uh, so this is, um, this is the whole cornucopia or the whole web or the whole, uh, uh, Rosas, if you wish, of uh, eight particle limits that uh, we obtain. Uh, and you notice here that uh, as before, not only are there lines connecting origins, even of different types, so this will definitely have, uh, uh, yes, the, the cross ratios will change by finite amounts along these lines but there are also two dimensional surfaces. So this pentagon over here, or uh, yes, this pentagon over here, uh, these are, uh, uh, um, yes, uh, um, two dimensional um, boundaries of, this, of the positive region where all their points are, are, uh, are origin points. Uh, and, uh, it turns out that indeed uh, there is quadratic logarithmic behavior also on these two dimensional limits, and in fact, even in three dimensional limits. So for the, for the octagon, we find the simple quadratic uh, <coughs> logarithmic behavior, not only on points, not only on lines, not only on surfaces, but also on three dimensional worth 
some spaces of people. Yeah. Any questions? But this comment is not super clear from the image itself, is it? Or which comment? Last? The last one. Yes, let me. So it's true that one can hear only see the. Uh, uh, yes, the um, let's say surfaces. Uh, yes. If if one if one goes. So what one can do, so this is the full, first of all, uh, uh, 1188 clusters, this is by not removing the parity half. And since um, the, so the, the amplitude itself should not depend on the rate of approach to the limit. So one can, in fact, um, identify all the clusters that, uh, only different differ by the rate of approach. And in this case, okay, this is also not super clear. So this is a coarser graph, uh, but I believe that, uh, let's see. So I will try to draw, try to pick this color. So it should be one. Yes, I, uh, I might uh, take longer than I would want and I don't want to delay you, but here one can find uh, clusters that uh, 12 points that are connected by 12 edges. And this is in fact a cube. Uh, so this is one of the three dimensional limits. Mm -hmm. uh, and one can, okay, one can move the things around to see let's say these three dimensional limits. Uh, and uh, indeed in our paper, we have a, or to do this better, one needs to cut this graph, you know, in, in one direction, let's say, look at a wedge of it and try to expand it uh, and move things around. But uh, indeed uh, it's not fully uh, obvious the three dimensional uh, uh, limits, but indeed we, we searched for them systematically and we found them. And this is also, okay, what I, I was telling you before. Uh, based on the data, we could uh, up to two, in some case, three loops. Uh, we checked that this simple double logarithmic behavior persists in all origin points, and in fact, also. To higher dimensional subspaces. Now, unfortunately, I am out of time. I think uh, uh, I was planning to mention a few brief things about the finite coupling uh, TBA, but let me know should I just keep it all together? Should I? Spend three, five times on it. What is the consensus? I, I, I guess because there were a lot of questions you have, like I'll give you more ten minutes. Is this is this okay? I think it's okay. Yeah, awesome. Thanks a lot. All right. So, any last questions as far as the perturbative uh, story and the like uh, classifying limits are concerned? Okay, let's go now to the TBA. So many of you might already know that thanks to the beautiful work of Aldina and Maldacena, <clears throat> uh, the strong coupling, uh, the leading strong coupling uh, uh, answer for amplitudes uh, it can be mapped uh, into a minimal area problem. It can be given by a classical string, if you wish, uh, whose endpoints uh, uh, lie at the boundary of anti Sitter space, uh, of uh, yes, where also the, the the field theory is defined, whereas the string theory lives in the bulk. This is the 
internal direction. So if you move along this way, you, you enter into the bulk of ADS space. And um, uh, therefore, uh, yes, to lead in order, you have this classical string, you have the, the, uh, the action of the classical string. Uh, so a string that, yes, sweeps a minimal area as it moves. Uh, and uh, uh, the, the, the amplitude is precisely this area, that, uh, the, the geodesic area that the, the string sweeps. Uh, and uh, were there any questions? Okay, so it's like a soap bubble. Uh, and uh, so this is a classical problem. You have the equations of motions that are differential equations. You have some boundary conditions you want. So this is, this is the Wilson loop uh, at the boundary. So in the, in the field theory, uh, uh, yes, uh, at the boundary of the space, namely the Wilson loop of n equals four per young mills. This is where the kinematic dependence hides. Uh, it has cusps, and you 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 have the boundary conditions. You have the differential equations. Find if you wish the surface, or find the area of the surface. This is the the the, the problem. And uh, this uh, this uh, classically integrable problem uh, can be solved even without specifying the surface. You don't have to really uh, find. All the, the the points, yes, of the on the interior of the surface. You can really go directly to the area, uh, and this is uh, done by certain auxiliary integral equations. Uh, uh, and uh, this this story, this relating classical integrability of uh, yes differential equations to thermodynamic Bethe ansatz equations. This was noted long ago. It was used also in the context of supersymmetric gauge theories and their moduli spaces, and also picked up by, by these authors over here. Uh, so uh, this is, uh, you get something that looks like a thermodynamic Bethe ansatz, uh, but uh, it's actually a completely classical problem. And uh, if you haven't seen T TBA before, uh, I guess I will only have to flash it and forgive me for being so quick, uh, um, but you can think of, yes, uh, uh, having M identical particles, uh, relativistic ones that have some mass M, and they move some speed or some rapidity, relativistic rapidity uh, beta, and you put them on a circle of circumference lambda. If the spacing, let's say, in this lattice is one, then L is also the number of sides, so to speak, uh, yes, in this, in this circle. Uh, and the thermodynamic limit just means take the number of particles uh, and the number of the circle large, but keeping their uh, ratio fixed. This is what thermodynamics means, uh, taking particle density fixed, increase particle number and volume. Uh, and, uh, uh, if you remember from your statistical physics classes, being in thermodynamic equilibrium means that you need to extremize the so-called free energy of the system, uh, which is related uh, to the, or if you wish, it's the connected, uh, like uh, uh, Green's function or the connected, uh, yes, uh, um, uh, partition function, the connected partition function. Uh, where this is the partition function of the path integral. Uh, and by doing this extremization, and now I'm skipping many, many steps, but this paper by Zamologic is very readable, you find the, uh, the, the value of the, the free energy, uh, uh, and it is given in terms of the so-called Y function, which depends on the density uh, uh, of occupied states, so this is uh, <coughs> one way, so you go to the, uh, the continuum limit. <coughs> you can't talk about individual particles, but you're talking about the number of particles uh, inside the like, uh, range of rapidities. Uh, and uh, you can have 
the, the, the number of particles corresponds to occupied states, let's say more or le, morally of your one particle spectrum, and there are also unoccupied states. The same one would do, yes, for, uh, I don't know, a harmonic oscillator or a, like simple, uh, a very simple or, or a free fermion. Uh, but uh, it is this object here, this y function, that then obeys a nonlinear integral equation, which is called the thermodynamic beta angel. So this, uh, 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 you are trying to solve for this function y, and this function y is given as its integral. Uh, and uh, uh, yes, you also have the temperature appearing in this, in this game. This uh, is the driving term of this uh, thermodynamic beta Anzac equation. So this was lightning fast, but hopefully just to set the stage. And uh, so the, the story with the strong coupling TBA is similar, but much more complicated. So it's the similar form of equation, but uh, you have <clears throat> uh, now three N minus five different particles or Y functions. Uh, and the, the, the form is similar. Uh, you can uh, now, you don't really have temperature, but you have, uh, let's say, the, the external kinematic variables appear in your driving terms. Uh, and so if you wish, you can think of the, the values of the external kinematics in certain kinematic variables as telling what the temperature of the system is. What is the chemical potential? And <laughs> in the similar way that you see, you need to solve this equation exactly, or this is hard numerically usually, you plug it in and you find then the, the free energy. Uh, in a similar fashion, here you need to solve for these functions and then you, um, uh, you, you plug them in the free energy of this thermodynamic system and this gives you the area or the amplitude. This is a very um, uh, like uh, rough sketch of uh, how things go. Uh, and uh, when we, you go to origin limits, you can simplify these equations. The, uh, the story is that some of these variables that control the kinematics become very large. Uh, so if you have, for example, but uh, phi goes large and tau goes large, and also the difference go, goes large, it means that this whole term here goes large, and therefore that the, the corresponding y function also becomes very large. Uh, and uh, uh, some other y functions do not exhibit this behavior. Um, uh, only those for which the corresponding kinematic variables uh, have a large driving contribution. And so you can um, approximate some Y functions as being very large and others as being zero. And the story is that the, this TBA, although a very complicated nonlinear equation, linearizes. You essentially have that this becomes log of Y when something is large or zero where something is small. So you have log of uh, y is large on the left, log of y large on the right, linear integral equation. And then you can solve this with Fourier transform, with a sort of Fourier transform. And uh, once you do it, you plug it in the, <laughs> the, the free energy of the system that has some relatively complicated form again, in terms of these Y functions. Uh, these do simplify when, so for the small, those that go to zero, you drop them all together, the contributions. For those that become large, this is roughly equivalent to, I don't know, half log Y S square. So things do simplify a bit and you can, use the solution, uh, the Fourier transform solution that you have obtained. So this is an example of the six particle, uh, yes, solution. So you can solve it example, you plug it in and you have a Fourier transform of your area, your final integral with respect to this uh, Z variable, which is 
conjugate to uh, the, the rapidity, uh, the, the, the velocity of uh, the, the particles in the, in the original TBA. And uh, you can also explicitly evaluate uh, this uh, polynomial, this, this integral, and you see that it's uh, 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 some, some rational uh, uh, expression uh, where this is a polynomial of up to some degree, and it's also quadratic in the, in the, in the kinematics. So after the dust settles, you have, uh, um, yes, something that if you want, you could just evaluate directly, but uh, do the final integration and get a, like, um, a strong coupling answer. Um, but you can write it also as a contour integral. So this is, uh, uh, yes, uh, you, can, you can equivalently write this integral by adding a log and then integrating this co uh, contour integral along the, so there is a branch cut here for this log. Uh, and then you, you just integrate it. And so you get the discontinuity across the branch cut, which is, I don't know, pi to pi. And this reduces also to this. Uh, so th these are equivalent, uh, uh, yes, uh, ways to write the same result. Uh, but um, you notice that, first of all, all the, the, uh, the uh, poles of the integrand are on the unit circle. So let me try to draw this also. Okay, this is not very unit, but let's say that this is one and minus one. And so there are poles over here. So you notice it has a very simple pole structure. So if you want, you can deform the contour and evaluate it along the, the residues. And uh, the, the very cool thing about this uh, like uh, integral is that, let's say in the six particle case that was known, uh, you evaluate uh, the residues and you see that the residues essentially predict to you the values of alpha. If you take this integration variable Z, so this is the Z plane, uh, to, to be e to the two minus i alpha, as I told you, all the residues are on the unit circle. So this is alpha is real. And uh, you, uh, you essentially, yes, uh, you evaluate this formula, you, you obtain the, the strong coupling prediction of the known finite coupling formula as I flashed to you earlier, uh, where in particular uh, the, the Z uh, has, yes, this, the, 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 the residues correspond to the values of the, the tilt angle. And so the final conjecture is very simple. If this story essentially gives you, predicts to you the tilt angles, uh, these angles, Okay, this is information independent of the coupling. And it's true that uh, you can only, you, you only have the coupling dependence in front because it's the strong coupling. Uh, but why don't I promote the strong coupling expression of gamma into the finite coupling expression of gamma and put it in the integral? And this is indeed uh, what we did and it matches with all perturbative data of seven and eight points, and we believe it to be therefore a finite coupling formula for the origin limits uh, at all multiplicity. Thanks a lot and sorry for going. Okay, I guess a lot over time. Okay, guys, that's San Giorgos. Okay. And now we have a few more minutes for questions. Uh, any questions here? All right, so. so you didn't talk about the future directions. 
what you have in mind after this? Okay, that's a very, very good question. Uh, so, uh, <clears throat> something that is very exciting uh, is the fact that, uh, it's okay. Yeah, I'll start with the speculative because I, I tired you a bit and I'm sorry about this. Uh, and thanks for your excellent questions overall. Uh, one cool thing about this like uh, generalized, uh, uh, this tilted cusp anomalous dimension is that the value at alpha equals pi over two, pi over four, sorry. So the cusp, cusp, obeys uh, maxim, principle of maximal transcendentality. which means that the quantity, so gamma pi over four in QCD, uh, most complicated, most complicated, equals gamma of pi over four in N equals four. So it would be really interesting to see if, uh, there are other quantities uh, that uh, also obey this principle of maximal transcendentality for other values of alpha. Uh, and in fact, uh, yes, as I mentioned earlier, the Belitskian collaborator showed that this uh, um, gamma is alpha equals zero <clears throat> value uh, of the tilt angle controls off shell form factors in N equals four. It is an open question if uh, it also controls the maximum transcendental uh, uh, part of offshell uh, form factors in QCD, for example. And uh, so this is something uh, interesting, although speculative. Um, other, uh, other, let's say, I, I did not, there were also some loose ends that I did not mention and uh, the, the, these loose ends are that, in fact, this procedure only gives you a subset of the, all the origin limits, the cornucopia or the corozas of origin limits I told you, not all of them. Uh, up to eight points, we showed that if you know the, the remainder function in one of these regions, you can also obtain it in all the rest, in one limit in all the rest but it's unclear if this also persists at uh, higher points. Uh, it would be also nice to know uh, if there are, uh, yeah, what is the maximal like uh, origin uh, subspace of kinematics? We saw that uh, for uh, n equals six, you have points. So let's say d equals zero. N equals seven, you have D equals one. N equals eight, you have D equals three. What is the general end? These are some possible future questions. Of course, also, yes. Can this help for higher point correlators, for example? Could one do a similar uh, story with what uh, Vasco and uh, Carlos and uh, Pedro did for the six point correlator? Of course, seven higher point correlators are even much more difficult. They have even more cross ratios, uh, the number explodes, but it would be interesting if uh, uh, this could also be explored, this equivalence. Yeah, interesting. Uh, other questions or comments? Okay, if not, let's thank Yorgos once again.